Um, can you please say your name, date, and place of birth? That's for the movie. <laughs> My name is Vera Gissing. I was born in Czechoslovakia in Prague um, on 4th of July, 1928. Thank you. Can you please tell us about your childhood before the war? I was a real nuisance very often to my family. I always got into scrapes and uh, I lived in a little town outside Prague called Čelakovice. Um, those were idyllic years of my life. I had an older sister called Eva and she was four years my senior. Um, rather pretty and serious and she got all the new clothes and I got her cast offs and she was clever and I wasn't, you know. So I didn't really, I loved her, but I didn't really like her. But later on, when the clouds started to gather and names like Hitler often came into conversation, I started to feel that there's something menacing in the air. And one day, I was at school, and no, I was at home actually, and it was snowing, and it was March, and it, March isn't the month where it normally s snows. But I crept out of my bed, and I went to the window, and my parents were standing there. And it was then that there were line upon lines of German soldiers marching into our square. I didn't know the meaning of it then. As I said, I wasn't even 10 years old then. But um, when the German soldiers took over our school, I felt quite happy because I thought we'll be in for an unexpected holiday because our school had closed. I had no idea what was in front of us. Not until the head of the soldiers took over part of our house and commanded Father to speak only German in that house. And Father said, I am the head of this household. And as long as we am alive, we shall speak Czech and German only in your presence. And it was then that the commandant stood up and spat in my father's face. And I vowed I would never, ever utter a word of German again, and I didn't. And that was my introduction to what was really in front of us, and an introduction to the thoughts of father, because it was that moment that he realized that we were in danger. If that commandant could do something as he did, and from that moment on, he and mother were doing everything they could to try and find way for my sister and me to get to England. Nobody heard about Nicky Winton then. And um, when I was told one day, soon afterwards, that both my sister and I were chosen to come to England, I thought it was just going to be a holiday trip, that it won't last long. But unfortunately, fate had other things in store for us. Wouldn't you like to carry on? And well, they had, yeah, I think that? they want to ask different questions. Yeah, OK, yeah. you ask different questions, know. yes. Well, to begin, could you please say your name, date, and place of birth? <laughs> well, yes, my name is Milena Grenfell Baines, and I was born in Prague on November the 11th, 1939. Could you please now describe your childhood before the war? Maybe what was your family life like before the outbreak? Um, I too was not exactly an obedient child. <laughs> um, I kept getting into trouble. But uh, in my young years, uh, we lived in a little village called Prosec Uskuce. 
which was in Českomoravská Vysočina. But then in 1937, my mother was a doctor there, and uh, my father um, used to travel to Prague because he was um, um, an advertising manager for a medical magazine. And we moved to Prague in 1937. Um, and I had a perfectly normal childhood. Um, I went to school, um, where I have some photographs which... Um, well, I was pulling very silly faces at this photograph because <laughs> um, I was a naughty girl. Um, and then one day, um, as Vera was describing my memories, of course, of the Germans marching into Prague. And within two or three days, my father had left. And I was told many years later that my father had been warned to leave by the Czech underground because he was responsible for... Uh, do you know who Thomas Mann was? Okay. But Thomas Mann was a very famous German author and he was expelled from, from Germany and he was made stateless. And my father was a great admirer of Thomas Mann. And he first of all approached our village if they would give him what they call a domicile. And from there they had to ask the president and Benesch who agreed. And my father went to Switzerland and uh, to present Thomas Mann with a Czech passport. And he was warned by the Czech underground that immediately the Germans, when they arrived, they'll be looking for him. And within two or three days, the Gestapo did come and searched our apartment. And he had already left. He escaped via Berlin, where he was hidden by a disguised Gestapo man who sent him on and eventually came to England. So my father had left, but I didn't really know what was going on. I mean, I remember my mother being taken away for questioning, and uh, they kept her for 24 hours. She came back. Uh, she, she really didn't know where he was. And then one day I was told, you're going to go to England. And uh, you're going to learn a little English. So the first thing we had to learn was God Save Our Gracious King, which was the national anthem. <laughs> so I can still remember that one. Um, and uh, one day, and the same day as Vera, mm -hmm. I was taken to the railway station with my sister, who was four and a half and my mother and my grandparents and my uncle uh, came to see us. I have an autograph book at home in which they wrote on that very day. Um, I remember my uncle writing, as much as I know that you will never lose yourself in this world, I'm absolutely sure you're going to lose this autograph book. <laughs> <laughs> and it so happened that actually I thought I'd lost it but I found it again. I found it again not long ago. And there are the autographs of my grandparents, my aunts and uncles, of President mm -hmm. Benesch, of Jan Masaryk. Um, I have the autograph of Jan Masaryk. Um, but we're talking about my, my, my travels to England. And I was on the train with my little sister and my little cousin who was two and a half at the time. And we came to England and we were adopted by an English family, but I think you've got other questions you want to ask. How did Nicholas Winton find you? We found him. You found him. What? <laughs> Your parents found him. No, 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 no. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful story how we found him. We found him in two different ways, actually. One day, um, Greta, his wife, was clearing out the attic, and she found a trunk. Ah, missed, how did Nicholas Winton find you? First. Well, we found him first. But when you were nine years old, eight years old. Oh, that we don't oh, know. We don't know. <laughs> I can tell. I can tell. Very much. She might have. Yes, I don't know. Because I've we researched that. I've researched that subject um, quite deeply. Um, because um, I, I, I came after the war back to Prague. I lost my family, and after the communists, I came back again to England. Right. So, um, and then I felt because we got together and had a school reunion, I felt um, I must do something to bring us all together. And at that time, we, you and I met, met uh, once again. And, um, and um, we heard about Nicky Winton um, that, um, well, he, he surfaced. It was through the Vesely, wasn't yes. it? 
an, another child. That I can, I can tell you, I can tell you how yes. he surfaced, actually, yes. if you don't mind. No, you um, Nicky was very involved in charity work, Nicky Winton, mm. and he was one of the founders of Homes for Old People called Abbeyfield Homes. And they were having an annual general meeting with the other voluntary managers of Abbeyfield Homes from different towns. And this gentleman from Sheffield, called Rudy Vesely, came to the annual general meeting and found himself sitting next to this other gentleman, slightly older, and they started chatting. And uh, this gentleman said to Rudy, oh, we still had an accent. He said, where are you from? He said, oh, he said, I came on a train from England in 1939. And this gentleman said, oh, I was the chap that organized those trains. And Rudy said, and you're the man who saved my life. And that's how he was found from one side. But at the same time, Greta, his wife, was in the attic looking through some old documents, and she said, what's this? And he said, oh, something I did before the war. Nothing. Get, get, get rid of them. <laughs> nothing, nothing to do. And she said, you can't possibly get rid of the, our photographs, our letters, all <clears throat> the documents that he had organized about bringing us to England. But again... I think Vera did more research into mm -hmm. that afterwards. Um, and all this came to light. Um, the, pe the documents were sent to a newspaper. And the um, wife of the newspaper uh, owner, Mrs. Elizabeth Maxwell, thank you, Maxwell, <laughs> um, was al already interested in the problems of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. It all got into the hand of a television producer called Esther Ranson who had a weekly program on uh, British television mm -hmm. called That's Life. And so she got in touch with Mr. Winton and said, look, Mr. Winton, we'd love to do a program about you. Um, would you come to the studio? We'd like to tell your story. And he said, all right, now we're talking 25 years ago. And unknown to <coughs> him, she by then had discovered some of our names, telephoned us mm -hmm. and said, please come to the studio but we are not going to tell Mr. Winton that you're there. Mm. So we and were... I, I, I start take it from there. Yes, carry um, on. I was sitting next to Milena. No, was, he, no he was between us. He was us, between us. Between us. And um, I knew about him. I had already met his wife because to my absolute... Um, I was just so, 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 so much surprised that he lived only about 10 miles from my own cottage. All those years, you know, and I didn't know of his existence. Anyway, um, I was sitting next to him, and behind us was this chap whom Nicky Winton had already Rudy Vesely, met, this Rudy right. Vesely. And Nicky thought he'd like him to sit next to him because he didn't know anybody else, and he kept saying, go and move, go and move, go and, go and change your place. <laughs> And of course, I was instructed I mustn't move. No, and we, I was told you we're not at all. You know. but, but apart <laughs> from, <laughs> but apart from that, um, um, Esther Anson's um, husband was my partner's dentist. You know, so I was very, very well informed on all this, and it was just so wonderful, so terribly, terribly touching when. Joe, Joe is a very modest gentleman, yes. but let me tell you right now, if you say to any uh, Canadian, Joe Schlesinger, they'll know his name. He's the most famous war correspondent in Canada. He I has, think almost he, in Europe. Yeah, he's, so he, he, after the war, when he mm. finally had a very hard time getting to Canada mm. uh, with his brother, he had to work on ships, he had to wash up, he did all kinds of things. And then he got into a college and he um, started doing journalism. And he became one of the most famous correspondents and he covered all the post-war wars. Uh, but he, he may say something, but he's very modest. So I'm... Um, and we, of course, all know each other. We've known each other for the last we, 60 years. We like a family, you know. We kept in family. touch ever since we were at school. Were you on the same train? Yeah, yes, we were. Yes, we were on the not, same train. I don't know where the Joe was. Know. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> but we didn't. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we want you between us. <laughs>
Mezi náma, prosím. The rose between two thorns. A thorn between two roses. A thorn between two roses. Tak mluvíme, mluvíme, který jazyk mluvíme? English. Oh, English, OK, OK. Students of English. But of course, of course Joe came from Bratislava, so you can ask him some questions. Well, I can tell you that at one time I lived just around the corner here. And when I was seven and eight, I decided I was going to leave home. So I put on a rucksack, and my mother helped me pack. <laughs> and I walked out the door, and I came here to the Carlton and decided I didn't want to run away from home and went back. <laughs> so I know this place. It was here? Yeah, the Carlton. It's just oh, around the corner. No, no, but the Carlton was here? The Carlton, the Carlton, yeah, the Carlton oh. was here when I was, was a kid. I used to play in this park over here. My father used to go after lunch to play chess in a cafe. There's a passage going through to Dlaha Ulitsa. Is it this there? Is it still? Dlaha Ulitsa? Yeah. And upstairs there was a cafe, and he used to play chess, and we used to get, uh, um, um, you know, sort of Viennese coffee, Zeschlehano. <laughs> <laughs> Not coffee, sorry, I used to get sort of cocoa or chocolate. Hot chocolate. <laughs> and I still remember that, all this time later. So, anyway, actually born in Vienna, because in those days, in 1928, when I was born, it was still kind of Stredny Europa, Middle Europa, and my mother went to have a child in Vienna. But I lived here for the first 11 years of my life. How old are you? I'm 80. <laughs> she wants to know. Oh, yeah. She wants I'm to know. Oh, I'm 80. <laughs> and uh, I lived uh, a few years down here. When I first was a little boy, I lived on Dluha Ulitsa, which is just one block over. And then we lived on Venturska which leads from the Corso there down to Bruja, I don't know whether you know it, down from Michal Skabrana. So that's where I lived. And uh, I, as a kid, I spoke Czech, Slovak, German, and I could swear in Hungarian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of those words that I s swear words in Hungarian, I didn't know what they meant till later. <laughs> Tell us something about your childhood before you went to Britain. Well, I mean, at the beginning it was a very happy childhood, as I said, you know, drinking hot chocolate across the street, oh. mm -hmm. uh, running away from home, <laughs> uh, seeing uh, seeing uh, Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in the Red Hill around the corner. So mm -hmm. this was this was my this is where I grew up. This was this. But then, of course, things started going awry, and even if you were a little kid, you were aware of what was happening. You could hear it on the radio. You could hear Hitler's voice raving on the radio. You could see the, the, the Linkova Garda marching through the streets. You could see the, 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 the Germans here marching through the streets yelling, Lieber Führer, mach uns frei from the Czechoslovakai. Dear, dear leader, make us, free us from Czechoslovakia. And in particular, of course, a lot of it, both from the Hlinkova Garda and the Hitler Jugend and God knows what else, was aimed at the people I loved, at Jews. So I was suddenly aware of being a, of being, of being a victim. And at one point, I remember going to school and being chased by a couple of Hitler Jugend guys down the street. So things become, became less and less pleasant and more and more threatening. And one of the things, again, I remember from the red around the corner, is being at a wedding there early in 39, it must have been, when I first heard my mother say to a friend of hers, we're going to send my boys, my boys, in other words, my brother and me, we're going to send my boys, our boys, to England until things blow over, you understand. It was the expectation was that somehow this would go away and things would settle down. And I remember when the Nazis ma marched into Petrozalka, just across the river, in um, March 1938. So all these memories are there. And they're not pleasant ones. And it got less and less pleasant. And of course, after we were sent to England, 
my parents were first deported to Hlohovets, which is just a little out of town here, and then sent to Poland, where they died in circumstances that I still don't know to this day. And that, in brief, is my story. Until I came back after the war, and I didn't come back to Bratislava, because Bratislava had too many painful memories. I went to Prague, uh, and three years later, the communists took over. And uh, I started the only thing I, the only thing I knew was I w spoke several languages, so I started working as an interpreter translator for the Associated Press. And then the communists started arresting Associated Press staffers, so I got the signal. I remember being here, and as a matter of fact, I was in the Carlton here when the desk clerk whispered to me that a guy in a leather coat from the starting best pensioners from the state security was asking after me. So I got the idea I had better get out of town. And the first time I tried to get out of the country was in Petrozalka with a smuggler. And just as we got near the border, a patrol came by with, with a dog, with a sniffing dog. And we just hit the ground. And they went by. And I thought we would go. And he said, no, we've got to go back because they'll be back with the dogs. And they'll pick up our scent and follow us. So that was the first time around. The second time around, I got out in, through Czeska Belenice to Gmünd in, in Austria. In '39, when we were going to Britain, Slovakia was already a separate state and Bohemia and Moravia were a German protectorate, and we couldn't travel to Prague where the train left from because that was a different country. So uh, we had to take a train from Bratislava through the Czech protectorate to Lovosice, which was the first station inside Hitler's Reich. It was in this, what was the Sudetenland, in other words, it had been Czechoslovakia before. And we had to spend the night there waiting for the train because the train from Prague was late. But we couldn't go to the waiting room because the waiting room was close to Jews. Jews could not go into a waiting room in a station in Germany. So we spent the night in the toilet. The t last time I saw my father, we spent the night in a pissoir inside Nazi Germany. And I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. I still have the smell of the, the tar in the, in the urinal in my, I can still smell it. And then we got on the train, and the train went through Germany in a, was, it was sealed. It was like Lenin going to Petrograd in the Russian Revolution in a sealed train. Through, you know. And there were all these little kids, and some of them cried, and some of them were having a good time. And little boys in those days used to be fans of railroads. We used to watch trains, you know, locomotives, what size they were, how many wheels they had, and all this sort of thing. And all these, I remember we were going through a station in Leipzig, and there was a train there that looked like it had a propeller, and all the little boys rushing, trying to figure out why, why did they have a propeller, whether the propeller was just decorative or not, etc. So then we hit the, the Dutch border, and all of a sudden the mood changed. And there were all these people bringing us food, and they had white bread. Mm. And I, of course, was used to bread, the bread we had here, mm. which was dark. And this stuff was kind of, I you didn't like it. No, you know, like didn't like it. We throw, the, then, we throw it away. Yeah, we had, yes, we, we threw, threw it away. away. <laughs> uh, we had hot chocolate. And English tea yes. with milk. <laughs> yes. That yes. was horrible. Yes. And then we took a boat from. Uh, from the Hook of Holland across the English Channel. And it was much bigger than any boat that I saw here on the, on the Danube, you know, the, the paddle steamers that they had here. And sometime during the evening, I could hear uh, people in some other cabin, and I went over. They were singing, Gdedom of Mui, Gdedom of Mui, the Czech anthem, Where's My Home, Where's My Home? And of course, we were then at a stage where we had no home. And for a lot of us, we didn't have a home for God knows how long. And then we got to Britain and we picked up. I went to an aunt and uncle 
and a whole new phase started. Of uh, the war started two months later, and everything changed. In the first stage of the war, we had a few letters that were smuggled out from my parents, and then all the news stopped. And as I said, to this day I don't really know what happened to them. I don't think any of us. No, we know. No, we just see. We've seen the names on the wall in the synagogue. In that, yes, in mm. the Czech lands, not, not, not here. here, not here as mm. far as I know. Mm. As a matter of fact, what was left of what used to be the Jewish part of town was, was torn down when they did the access road uh, past the dome to that new bridge, the mm. fancy new bridge. It was all torn away, it just disappeared. So. Mm. That must have been very hard for you, you know, to see that. It must have been very hard for you. Uh, yes, know? yes. It it's isn't that I lived there. It was no, just that it, it seemed matter. to me like it. Mm. Mm. It's interesting your, your arrival yeah, in England the... because mm. I was collected by a gentleman and he and his wife, they had a very little house, two up, what we used to call two up and two down, and they boarded their own daughter out with a grandmother so that they could take me and my sister. Well, in my case, I went to an aunt and uncle mm -hmm. who lived in the north of England. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we, mm -hmm. we overnighted somewhere when we got to London, overnighted somewhere. And they put me, my brother, and he was two years younger than I was, so I could look after him, on this mm -hmm. train to a place called Newcastle on Tyne. And before we left Bratislava, I looked up the Atlas, and there were eight Newcastles <laughs> in the United Kingdom. And all the time, it was 300 miles, all the time up there, I worried we would end up in the wrong Newcastle. <laughs> and I didn't speak a word of English. Not a word no, of English. Did. I didn't no. speak no, any English not either. Did. And, you know, when we came, I mean, there were about 200 and odd children of us. And we were placed in a big hall. I think it was bigger than this one. And, and, and we sat there and name after name was called. And there was little me, not quite 10 years old. And my sister disappeared because she, I knew she was going to a place called Bournemouth, which is rather um, posh, a posh town in south of England. In fact, she was going to a very posh boarding school. And I knew I was going to Bootle in Liverpool. And you won't know, but if you look at your map, you might see the little Bootle, and it was one of the most sort of deprived areas of, um, of Liverpool. And anyway, can you imagine that right at the end, there was just me and no kids, and my sister only could come to me for a few minutes, give me a scribbled note with her address on, give me a hug and go. Anyway, to make a long story short, I was taken by the chap who, organ who headed the transport to some archbishop, and I stayed there for two days and two nights. And then they said, now you're going to meet your um, guardian. And um, I was taken to a big hall again, and it was again something like this. I'll never, I always think of it when I see this sort of a floor because I was sitting there next to my rucksack and I was shaking at the knee, wondering who's going to come and claim me. And then the door opened and in came a little lady and she wasn't even as tall as I was. And she had a hat and glasses and a great big smile which spread right across her face. And she ran towards me and she hugged me and she spoke words I didn't understand. But you know what they were? You shall be loved. And I mean, those are the most wonderful, the most important words any child separated from home can hear. They were very poor but they had a heart of gold. I want here just to tell you something which is a very, very deep thought which didn't occur to me at the beginning, but years later. Their daughter, Dorothy, was three years older than I. 
And as I said, they were poor people. And her dad wanted to save at least one child's life from Hitler. And he said to Dorothy, that's what I want to do. But it would mean you'd have to share your bedroom. It would mean you could only have um, um, one holiday a year and share your pocket money. Would you be willing to do that? And she said she would. Now, she was, as I said, 13 years old. Now, if she had a negative response, I wouldn't be sitting here today. And you know, this just shows how you, and young, even younger children than you, how you can help in this world where help, when help is needed. And I was very, very lucky with that family. Um, the Rainfords, as they were called, they always say, there's only one God and it doesn't matter where you worship, but what matters is how you behave and help other people. And I think that's very important.